Sorry, good afternoon. Thank you all for coming to our annual Martin Luther King uh, observance. We thank all of you for taking your time to come out. We're going to start our program, and we again thank you for coming, and I hope that you're going to be inspired and uplifted by our speaker and by the elements of the program that we have today. To open us in prayer is going to be the Reverend Collins A. Days, who is the senior pastor of Second Baptist Church here in Atlantic City, Reverend Days. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father, we do thank you and we honor you today for the occasion for which we've gathered. We thank you for the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, the tremendous accomplishments he's made. We celebrate him today. And as we celebrate it, Lord, we are challenged and charged to continue the effort of equality and justice throughout our country. We pause now to pray for our government, not only local, state, and federal. Pray for our president. Pray you give him a sane mind, a civil tongue, and a compassionate heart. Remind him, Lord, that you have all power in your hands. That Pharaohs die. Abimelechs die. That kings die. Even presidents die. And one day all will stand before you and give an account of the deeds done in the body. We pray, God, as we are reminded that righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is reproach to any people calls us now to take the baton, the mantle of leadership, to stand for justice and stand for that which is right in all that we do. We pray now that you bless Dr. Gaba. We thank you, God, for her position as she leads now ACCC into a new legacy, yes. a new era. Yes. Give her courage, give her wisdom. Give her a heart for our community. It calls her to give us words of encouragement and inspiration, and most of all, challenge to face the issues of this community. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Yeah. 
We will have scripture reading by Rabbi Aaron Krauss of Bethel Synagogue, who is here again for his 48th consecutive year. And we thank God for him and also our other scripture reader, Reverend Thelma Witherspoon, who is always here. They will read scripture in that order. <clears throat> Dear, dear friends, when I was much younger, when I ask an older person how he or she feels, almost invariably, what was I told? Some good days and some not so good days. Now that I'm a bit older, I knew what they were talking about. But what's true of an individual it's also true of a nation. Nine years ago, an African-American was elected President of the United States. In the lifetime of Dr. King, that would have been an incredible experience and re-elected. Well, a nation turned a corner, and now it appears the nation is turning another corner. This is the life of a nation, the life of an individual. One of the favorite prophets of Dr. King, whom we love to quote, was a prophet Amos, who lived 28 centuries ago. He came from a humble background, and he was a spokesperson for the poor. He referred to them, constantly referred to them. And we think of the civil rights movement in this country and elsewhere. I think of the prophet Amos and listen to what he said 28 centuries ago. This is chapter 9, beginning with verse 7 of the prophet Amos. Are you not as the children of the Ethiopians unto me, O children of Israel, saith the Lord? Have I not brought up Israel out of the land of Egypt, and the Philistines from Kaftor, and Aram from Kir? Then he goes on to say, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes him that soweth seed, and the mountain shall drop sweet wine, and the, all the hills shall melt. And I will turn the captivity of my people Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. They shall make gardens and eat the fruit thereof. I will plant them on their own land, and they shall no more be plucked up out of their land which I have given to them, saith the Lord thy God. God bless you each and every one for coming here today, all those participating in this service. Good afternoon. I will be reading from you for you St. Matthew chapter 25, verses 34 through 40. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was in hunger, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hunger, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in? or naked, and clothed me? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto me? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it 
unto me. And the word of the Lord is already blessed. We thank our scripture readers. If you're following the program, it says selection, but we're going to make a couple remarks for the selection. And after that, it says remarks by Mayor Gilliam. I'm not Mayor Gilliam, but he had a conflict and he won't be here today, but he asked me to say to those assembled the same thing that he said at the Civil Rights Garden, that he is going to govern with love and govern with compassion. And uh, I wanted to convey that to you. Also, the same thing with our council president, uh, Marty Small, who's not here. Uh, he has the same sentiments that he wanted me to convey. Uh, before we get started, let me just recognize some of our public officials. Uh, not because everybody is not important, everyone is important. But our public officials are going to have a burden uh, that they're going to have to speak out against President Trump, who claims he's not a racist, but everything we hear him say indicates the opposite. So those of us who are blessed to be elected have the responsibility of speaking against this and standing against a president who doesn't see anything wrong with the Klan, who gets praised by David Duke for his statements, who denigrates Muslims and Hispanics and Mexicans. Uh, that's a terrible time for us to stand in 2018, but that is our challenge. So elected officials we want to recognize, starting Councilman uh, Jeffrey Fauntleroy, who is our newest elected Atlantic City Councilman. <laughs> Sitting next to him is uh, newly elected Sheriff, Sheriff Eric Shuffler. In the back of the church, but not the back of our minds, is our Councilman Jesse Kurtz from Atlantic City. And of course, the, uh, one of the leaders here at St. James and a longtime Councilman and my neighbor, Councilman William Speedy Marsh. Also, Councilman Randolph from the First Ward is here, Councilman Aaron Sporty Randolph. Reverend Days will almost have enough people to have a council meeting here. <laughs> also, this next person is not a councilman, but we are so proud of him. And he shows what happens when you have diversity and when you open up the jobs and the positions to someone who has talent regard without looking in a narrow way. And that's none other than our Atlantic County prosecutor, the Honorable Damon Tiny. And last but certainly not least, our municipal presiding judge, Judge Billy Moore. I thought I saw her coming. Billy Moore is here. Again, let me thank St. James. Uh, Reverend Coxum is a civil rights star in his own right. Whenever we need a venue, St. James is always available. And we always thank you, uh, Reverend Coxum, for allowing us to use this great church. Someone told me you get in trouble when you start recognizing people, so you always leave somebody out, and they sometimes charge it not to your head, but to your heart. But let me just say, if we left anybody out, uh, let me apologize, but I did want to recognize the presiding elder of the AMB district, uh, also my neighbor, uh, presiding elder Larry Dixon. Ladies and gentlemen, very briefly, the Atlantic City Branch NACP stands here in 2018, and we want to indicate to you that it's our goal to make sure that we're going to stand up for civil rights and social justice in our area. As we speak, unfortunately, Atlantic City at the Casino Re Reinvestment Development Authority, which is a state authority that has great power, there are no people of color. Also, as we stand here today on King Day 2018, at South Jersey Transportation Authority, which is another state authority that has great power, there are no people of color. Those are conditions that are unacceptable. That's a standard that should not exist. And we've talked to our governor-elect, uh, Governor Murphy. Governor Murphy believes in diversity, as you can see from the people he's put in his cabinet. And it is going to be our job to stay on the case and to make sure 
that we correct these grievous oversights. It is intolerable in 2018 that you have commissions, boards, advisories that has vast power that has no people of color. That's just unacceptable. That can't go on and we're gonna speak against it. Also, the Superior Court judges has 28 judges in the Visnich that covers Atlantic and Cape May County. There's only three people of color who are judges. And those of us who know, we know that there are plenty of people who are qualified to be judges and should be considered. So in 2018, we not only have a president who says he's not a racist, but makes demeaning statements against all of Africa and Haiti, who thinks Frederick Douglass is still living, who, who rode to fame on saying that the president, President Obama was born in Kenya, who gives rise to things that you would thought was in 1958 instead of 2018, who's praised by David Duke. Anytime David Duke praises you, you know you're in trouble. So that's where we're at in 2018. So again, we want to thank you all for coming out. We have a speaker. I'm not going to speak, but I just want you to know that the NACP is a group that is dedicated to making sure that we address these wrongs in a legal, nonviolent way. Let me turn your attention very quickly to the back of your program. You'll see three announcements that I'd like you to underscore and underline for your attention. Please, ma'am, and please, sir. The first announcement is our general membership meetings. I was talking to a local attorney, and he asked, when are the meetings? And I said, the meetings are the second Monday from 6 to 7 at Jeffro Memorial Presbyterian Church, 423 North Ohio Avenue. The membership of the NACP is open to everyone. We invite you to join. Tuesday, April 3rd, is the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. King. And we're going to have a program at Second Baptist Church. Our good friend, Reverend Days, has opened Second Baptist Church at 6 o'clock in the evening. And I would encourage you to put this date on your calendar. If you've never heard Reverend Willie Francis, Francois speak, you've missed something. If you've heard him speak, you know that he is a speaker par excellent. He is going to be our guest speaker on that day, Tuesday, April 3rd. That's going to be the 50th anniversary of Dr. King. Put that on your calendar. Please try to make that event. Saturday, April 28th is the last Saturday in April. But more importantly than that, it's our annual Freedom Fund breakfast at Golden Nugget. That's 8.30 in the morning. And we are honored and pleased to have Damon Tyner, our prosecutor, as our guest speaker. Please circle that. You'll be hearing more about that. Take out an ad, buy some tickets, make sure you attend that. Also, that will be the first time that we give the Pierre Hollingsworth Memorial Scholarship. Many of you remember Pierre Hollingsworth. He was a member of this great church. He was the president of NACP for a long time. He was a, uh, one of the highest ranking African Americans in the fire department. He was an elected official. And he did many great things here in this city. Our scholarship fund is going to only go to local students. Uh, we believe that it's necessary for us to stress education and to help youngsters go to college. And I just want to thank the Boré uh, company, Wasim Boré. You probably saw his picture in the paper yesterday. He's developing a 250-unit housing, uh, apartment house complex in the first ward under the leadership of Councilman Randolph. He made a very, very generous donation to our scholarship fund. And uh, you will see the fruits of that on April 28th. I also want to thank the Schultz Hill Foundation for a very generous donation towards our scholarship fund. And also Jill Ozerkis and Cooper Levison for a generous donation. Uh, Levin, Staller, Schuyler, Brown uh, Law Firm for a very generous donation. Fox Rothschild, uh, Fleischman Daniels, and Arthur Ponzio. But you too can join in if you have a donation of any amount, we would be happy to receive it. Make the check to Atlantic City NACP in the uh, memo column, put scholarship fund, please. 
and send it to 423 North Ohio Avenue, and we will be happy to receive your contribution and acknowledge it, and you will help a youngster continue their college education. Again, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you for coming out. We'll have a selection by the choir, and after the choir, we're going to have remarks by the senior pastor of Grace Cathedral Church and the president of the Fellowship of Churches, my good friend and brother, Bishop Robert F. Hargrove II. Hallelujah. <clears throat>
Good afternoon. Let us put our hands together for our NAACP president, the Honorable Colleen Shabazz, for doing such an outstanding job. Many of us, our toes are still cold, but our hearts are warm. We want to, for a few moments, and very briefly because we do have a speaker, just want to say that we as the Christian community, when we analyze the life and the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., we do recognize that he was a reverend, a God-fearing man. And we have extrapolated from his life that our theology, how we see our God, must affect our anthropology, how we see humanity. And our anthropology must affect our sociology, how we see our community. And with that, we cannot stay inside the sanctified walls and allow the racist agenda in the White House to stretch its tentacles into our community and divide us. That's right. We must come together, especially the monotheistic religions, <clears throat> Christianity, Islam, and our Jewish brothers. We want to say to everybody that is here two things. Number one, we's all we got. And number two, we's all we got. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bishop, for those remarks. We's all we got. We okay, got, that, got that message. Uh, we have several clergy people here uh, today. And uh, I asked the bishop, should I try to acknowledge him? He said, you might do better just asking all the clergy uh, people to stand uh, so you don't leave anybody out. So I'm going to defer to the wisdom of the bishop and ask would all the uh, clergy people please stand uh, now so we can uh, recognize and thank you for, for coming out. <laughs> bishop, I think you were right because I see some people uh, that I didn't have on my list. So. More of that story is listen to the bishop. I saw Kason stand up and say, Kason, you're not no pastor. <laughs> <laughs> Next, we come to uh, a young man who's going to introduce the speaker. Now, I want you all to uh, pray for this young brother as he comes before us. There's a little more than 300 people in this uh, auditorium. And I don't know about you all, but when I was his age, I knew I don't, didn't have an occasion to stand up and speak before this many people. In fact, I'm sure I didn't. Brother Goodman, who's several years older than I am, he is nodding his head acknowledging that uh, we didn't have that kind of uh, opportunity. Uh, we thought that we need to encourage our young people, uh, we need to lift up our young people, and we need to put them in situations where they can shine and where they can develop their skills and develop their abilities to interact and communicate. So we asked this young man to uh, introduce the speaker. Really, the speaker needs no introduction. She's an accomplished, established leader in our area. But we wanted to follow protocol, and we wanted to, as we say, give our young people a chance. So bear with this young man. He's talented. He's articulate. He's intelligent. But as I said, when you come before a lot of people, uh, sometimes you may get uh, nervous, you might feel uh, hesitant, uh, you might feel anxious. So uh, we uh, ask you to give a round of applause as Stephen Byard from our Langston Youth Council comes to present the speaker of the day. Brother Byard. Good afternoon. My name is Stephen Barrett. I'm an NAACP Youth Council member, and I'm here to introduce our main speaker, Dr. Barbara Gabba. I'm gonna, first, I'm going to tell you some things about her. Dr. Barbara Gabba is the first woman and African-American president in the Atlantic Cape Community College history. Dr. Gabba received her master's degree from Rutgers University and her doctorate from Bayer University in Nigeria. Before coming to ACCC, she was provost and assistant vice president 
for the academic affairs at Union, Union County Community College, a position she held for 15 years. Prior to that, she was a dean of academic and student support services at Camden Community College. Dr. Gabba is a native in New York City and was raised by a single mother. Her mother, a widow, was hardworking and God-fearing. She raised her children in the church and taught them the rewards of hardworking, gratitude, and helping others. For Dr. Gabba, those lessons have been essential to the trajectory of her career. In memory of her mother, Dr. Gabba and her family created a scholarship bearing her mother's name. The scholarship will assist the serving ACCC students. To add to her life experience, she lived for 10 years in Nigeria, where she volunteered and worked at the American Embassy. As the president of the college, Dr. Gabber presides over three campuses, that being Atlantic City, Cape May, Community, Cape May County, and Mays Landing. Her success in invigorating relationships with regional four-year colleges has resulted, has resulted in agreements that allow students with a two-year degree from Atlantic Cape and seamlessly transfers to other institutions for completion of their bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. Dr. Gabba also values the importance of strengthening partnerships with area, with area high school and Ember, emphasizing the pivotal role Atlantic Cape can play in workshop development offering specialized programs in culinary arts, STEM, nursing, and aviation, and drone programs. Dr. Gabba states that her goal as president of Atlantic Cape Community College is to turn challenges into opportunities for students and county alike. The NAACP Atlantic City chapter is proud to introduce to you Dr. Gabba, Dr. Barbara Gabba. Yeah. After this selection, Dr. Gabba will speak.
very much for inviting me here today and to Brother Bayard. Thank you for that fine introduction. And I should say that uh, as a young child or as a young person, I started my speaking in the church. So you're off to a very, very good start. So I wanted to thank you for inviting me here today. And I can say that I'm honored and humbled that you asked me to speak on this great day to honor Dr. King. I would like to commend and thank Honorable Kaleem Chabaz and the NAACP for all the great work you're doing in Atlantic City to promote the legacy of Dr. King. Today, all across the country, we are honoring the life and the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King as a hero, an advocate, leader, role model for peace and justice. A lot of service work is being done today, and I know that there was a walk to commemorate and to honor Dr. King. The story of Dr. King is a story of a man who saw injustice and decided to do something about it. Yes. This is what each of us, regardless of race or position in society, should aspire to do. I can remember growing up in the projects in New York City, hearing about Dr. King and what he was doing for colored people. We all have a story about how Dr. King has inspired our life and it's how, how he has inspired what we think and what we believe. Let me share with you my personal story of how the work of Dr. King has impacted my life. My story begins with my mother, since she's had a very, very strong influence on my life. My mother, affectionately known as Miss Johnny May, grew up in the Jim Crow South in the 1930s. And she often told us stories of black people having to live on the other side of town, having to drink from separate water fountains, having to sit in the back of the bus. She experienced all of these, and growing up in that environment, she told me she believed that's just how it was. But that was back then. That was the life she lived, and all that she knew when she was growing up. However, life began to change when she graduated from high school at age 15 and came north to visit the family, and she never returned to the South. Being up north was a life-changing experience for her back then. Things were very, very different. Over the course of the years and with the growth of the civil rights movement under the leadership of Dr. King, she was convinced that equality for all people, no matter what color, was a human right. She always referred to Dr. King as our leader, our voice. Yes. She was married at 18, had three children, and was widowed at age 29. So she was left to raise those three children alone in public housing in New York City. Having grown up in the segregated South, she wanted more for her three children and always talked about Dr. King with such admiration and respect and how he was making things better for colored people. She emphasized hard work and education and respect for the law. Probably that last one was for my brother because she was a single mother raising a son. Because of the overt and subtle, subtle discrimination at that time, my mother instilled in us that we had to excel at what we did, since for some, at that time, color might have been a barrier. You have to be twice as good to be recognized, she would say. However, as times changed and Dr. Keem came along to question and challenge the status quo, she began to realize that things did not have to be the way it was and that there was hope for things to change. I am telling you the story to illustrate how Dr. King's leadership and his fight for equality influenced my mother and as such influenced my life. He inspired her to go beyond thinking that that's just how it is to challenging the status quo and thinking that this is what it should be. Dr. King made many successes along the way uh, before he was cut down, including that historic march on Washington. He increased voter registration. We all know about him leading that nonviolent march across the Pettit Big Bridge in Selma, Alabama. He is no longer here, but we who remain will continue to be a voice and sustain his legacy. Last week, on the eve of Dr. King's birthday celebration, the nation and the world was again witness to offensive rhetoric in sharp contrast to the doctrine, doctrine of Dr. King and what, what most Americans believe in. We all heard it, 
So there's no need for me to say those words here in this sacred house of worship. For me, those comments were hurtful, disrespectful, and very, very painful. It was very personal. Personal because my husband of 46 years is from one of those African countries that President Trump referred to. In fact, I had the pleasure of living in Nigeria for 12 years where I was teaching at the university and also later, later worked at the United States Embassy in Lagos, Nigeria. Also, my children were born there and went to school there before we returned to the United States when they were eight and 10 years old. So they were raised there during their early years. They're adults now. Needless to say, I was personally offended and hurt by those vile words that echo blatant racism and words that negate all that Dr. King stood for. Dr. King left a, left a legacy of love and compassion for all people. We are indeed a nation of immigrants comprised of people of all races, religions, and cultures who have worked hard and contributed to make this country the great place it is today. Dr. King spoke of respect, and he himself modeled that at all times. Dr. King spoke of equality and justice for all people. Dr. King spoke of the power of nonviolent protest. Divisive and hurtful comments by anyone, especially those occupying the highest positions of leadership, do nothing to demonstrate the legacy of Dr. King. Today, more than ever, we are reminded there is still work to be done to combat the racism that Dr. King so vigorously opposed. He was about justice and equality for all people. I would like to say that Dr. King fought for equal treatment for all Americans, for freedom, civil rights, and education. It is through education that Dr. Martin Luther King that he will be remembered always. My life work has been focused on education. I am so glad to be at Atlantic Cape Community College to serve this community. As I have said on so many occasions, when I see my students, I see myself, because I came from a background that many of my students come from. I'm very pleased and committed to my work at the college. As many of you may know, back in 1966, Atlantic Cape was the first college in this region, the first to serve anyone who wanted to come. We are an open access institution, which means we admit, we admit anyone who can benefit from education. This, what's, this is what makes the community college so special. In Atlantic County back then, various groups urged that a college be established in this area with the goal of providing educational opportunity to the entire community and discovering and developing talent at low cost and providing easy access. Providing affordable education for not just a few, but for anybody who can benefit is our prime mission. We are indeed an open access institution. Our commitment to education can be seen on our campus right here in Atlantic City. We are right across the street. I also want to note that back in February 1968, the college's main campus opened just two months, just two months before Dr. King was killed. We will never lose sight of our commitment to our community in Atlantic City. This is our 50th year and we're gonna to continue to move forward. As we celebrate equal access to all, this February, we are going to be opening our new student center as a part of our commitment to student success. We are very proud at Atlantic Cape of our workforce training programs. Not only do we serve nearly 5,000 credit degree seeking students, but over 3,000 students in our non-credit and workforce training programs. That's a total of 8,000 students. Since 1968, we have graduated over 22,000 students. Most would not have been given most would have not been given the opportunity to acquire a higher education degree or a workforce certificate without Atlantic, State, uh, without Atlantic Cape. And as I said, we're right here in Atlantic City and we're across the street. We have a legacy of helping many students uh, who have begun either in developmental or our English as a Second Language program. Many of them go on to graduate, they transfer to four-year colleges, or they attain a job. We have established uh, agreements with many universities, such as Stockton University, Rutgers, and Farley Dickinson's, to name a few, so that our students can seamlessly transfer their credits from Atlantic Cape to one of the four-year colleges. We are excited 
about being a part of the next wave of growth here in Atlantic County. And we are very, very committed to supporting uh, the workforce training and the new businesses and the new uh, casinos that will be coming into the area that will provide opportunities for our students and for our workers. Access to education, whether it be a short-term program or a degree, is very important to the entire Atlantic Cape community. We will continue to find ways to raise funds to help our students succeed. We don't want finances to be an obstacle for students to come to college yeah. because our foundation has been working very, very hard to raise money and I'm very, very proud of the work that the foundation has done. We have raised over $1.2 million in scholarships and emergency funds during our 50th anniversary celebration, which ended with my inauguration. <laughs> Last year, we awarded over $500,000 for scholarship, the highest in our history. We, we could not provide scholarships without the generosity of people in our community, and I'm sure that some of you are here today. Scholarship support from donors in our, is an investment in our young people. Through that support, many of our young people can aspire to be the role model and become the leaders that Dr. King so envisioned. They can be the leaders to carry on the legacy of Dr. King. In closing, on this important day, let's pledge to continue the work of Dr. King but there's still more to be done. We need to ask ourselves a few questions. Who do we want to be as a nation? And what are we doing to preserve the legacy of Dr. King? Right. Right. We must build on the foundation that Dr. King laid. When accepting the Nobel Peace Prize in Norway in 1964, Dr. King said, I have the audacity to believe that peoples everywhere can have three meals a day for their bodies education and culture for their minds, and dignity, equality, and freedom for their spirit. Mm. When I reflect back on the life of my mother, Miss Johnny May, she said, and I agree, Dr. Dr. King has moved us forward. A lot has been accomplished for the good. In fact, when President Obama was elected, she said she never thought that she would live to see a black man become the President of the United States of America. She also said, much more still has to be done. Let us extend the vision of Dr. King. Let us continue to look to Dr. King as our role model. Let us continue to educate our young people. And it is through, many, through the education of many that empowerment and equality is attainable. <clears throat> Finally, let us remember the words of Dr. King when he said, the function of education is to teach one to think intensively and to think critically intelligence plus character, that is the goal of a true education. Thank you and God bless you all. Dr. Gabba, don't go anywhere. We, we have a presentation for you. Oh, thank you so much. Go ahead. Um, hello. Um, this is for Dr. Gabba, and it's from the NAACP Adult and Youth Branch, and we would like to thank you for thank everything you. and all the information you have provided us. So thank you for speaking. Thank you for having me. this is for you. Thank, thank you. you. I'm Raleigh Williams. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay. Appreciate it. But tell them your name. They didn't hear you. They were clapping. I'm Raleigh Williams. Raleigh Williams. Thank you. Reverend Cox, when somebody not here in this uh, tabernacle said, Shabazz, you're not having a preacher for the speaker, <coughs> not here. And I said, well, I think that we need to have a flavor that is needed. And it's preaching, pastors of whatever denomination are always needed, but I think we need to have an educational thrust and I think our speaker today provided that thrust. And we want to thank you so much. Okay, next we're going to call uh, Reverend Coxum uh, to come up and direct us as we have our offering while the choir gives us uh, another selection. <clears throat> Thank you. 
All right, uh, we have uh, the baskets. First of all, let's put our hands together once again for our speaker, amen? Amen, Dr. Gabba, we just want to say thank you uh, once again for reminding us of Dr. King's legacy. And we're also grateful that God has sent you to this place for a time as this. And we look forward to continuing our work with you. May God continue to bless you and keep you as you continue to lead those into higher education. Uh, it's offering time. Oh, come on, you got to do better than that. It's offering time. If ever the work of the NAACP uh, is important, it's during this present time. And so today we want to be a blessing to this local branch of this NAACP chapter. And uh, we're going to ask you to dig a little deeper than you have planned. And somebody ought to say amen to that. Amen. amen. We want to help them financially to continue the work that they're doing. So right now we're going to ask that you please prepare uh, your offering. Uh, we're going to start uh, at the rear of the church. Uh, we're going to ask you to come by way of the center aisle and you will return by the way of the side out. And we're going to start uh, with those who are seated in the immediate back. If you would stand at this time and bring your offering forward. You would just lead them down by way of the center aisle. Thank you. Help me to hold down. Yeah. 
Amen. We're going to ask you to please stand now as we bless this offering by singing our offertory, All Things Come of Thee, O Lord. We're coming rapidly to the end of our program. And again, we want to thank all of you for, for coming out. Uh, you remember, I know, when uh, President uh, Trump said he wanted to ban Muslims from coming into the United States. Uh, I was talking to some friends of mine who are more intellectually acute than I, uh, Bishop, and they said, when you have a racist like this, watch where he goes next. And when you see he started next, on the Hispanic judge, and after that, he's in Africa and Haiti, so there's no stopping uh, a person who is a racist when he or she gets started and starts appealing uh, to the worst elements in our society. We saw even when they marched in Charlottesville, Virginia, he found common sides with those who marched and said they were equal, said the Klan was equal to the people who marched for freedom and justice. So. Uh, we need unity, so to uh, bring us a prayer for unity is the Imam of Masjid Muhammad in Atlantic City, Imam Amin Muhammad, and after that we'll have the benediction and closing remarks by uh, the pastor of this house, Reverend Dr. James Coulson, Imam Muhammad. <clears throat> Good afternoon. I didn't tell Honorable Kaleem Shabazz, but I have a new rule that I believe clergy need to do more than pray. They need to work and speak as well because just praying without works is dead. So with that, I'm going to take just a few words about unity. <clears throat> and I would like to just say this city needs unity. Not words of unity, but hearts that are unified. In order for hearts to be unified, individuals need to be sincere. In order to be sincere, you need to have a close connection to God. And to realize that you are accountable to God before anyone else. And if we all realize this, then unity will be easy for us. The other thing is that each and every one of us, no matter where we have arrived at in life, <clears throat> and our president, Donald Trump, arised, rose to the highest office in this land. I'm not one who likes to denigrate people. That's not a sign of unity. I'm one who want to see people reformed because I believe God put in all of us the ability to have virtue and vice. Let us work on our virtue and not concentrate on our vices. If we can do that, we would have true unity. If we can overlook, we can pardon, we can see the understanding of others and try to work with others to bring their understanding to that which is more mainstream, if it is deviant, then we would achieve unity. Let us all look inside our, ourselves. In this land, the land of democracy, democracy is an everyday project. You cannot have democracy only at the polls, only in the church, or only in the mosque, or only in the synagogue, on certain days, every day, make democracy work and you will achieve unity. With that, I pray, and we all would pray, that God would give us hearts that are united under his name. That God would unify us to do that which is beneficial to humanity. 
that God would give us the ability to see the good for others over the good for ourselves. That the individual can only be strong if the community is strong, if the society is strong. So let us forgive all the past transgressions that have affected all of us and look forward for a day of forgiveness and pardon and uplifting. May God give our president, our leaders, all those who are in influential positions in our society to be moral, dedicated, sincere people. And let us, as individuals who are under their leadership, be sincere, be honest, be upright, because it is only the people who put leaders. And if the people are not whole, then we cannot expect our leaders to be whole. May God give us the ability to see good in each and every one of us and to work hard as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. did to bring the best out of people. That is how we arrive to where we're at today by someone sacrificing their life, time, energy, family, health, wealth to bring about unity, prosperity, and upliftment in our society. In the name of God we pray, amen. for those words and those sentiments, uh, Brother Imam. Uh, before we uh, call Brother uh, James Reverend Cokes him up, let me just ask the uh, members of the Youth Council, uh, Atlantic City Youth Council to stand, and members of the Atlantic City uh, branch of the NACP to stand and, and thank them for, for their support. Youth Council, <laughs> Atlantic City branch. <laughs> we thank you all for your support and for your hard work and for your attendance today. Reverend Cokes, uh, from the uh, adult branch and the uh, youth branch, we have a little token of love for you, if you will come forward. Uh, we, we can't pay you for what you do. Uh, if we did, our little budget would be exhausted. <laughs> but we want to give you a love offering and, show, and tell you and try to show you uh, that we appreciate uh, what you do at St. James, what St. James does. We respect you and we honor you and thank you so much, sir. Thank you. And because we're a church that believes in civil rights, we believe in the work of the NAACP, uh, we believe in educating young people, uh, we would be remiss. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take this donation and uh, we want to ask our speaker uh, to use it uh, for the scholarship fund. Amen. How uh, to help students to continue to be educated. Amen. Once again, let's put our hands together for this president. Amen. Yeah. Amen. He's a president. Oh, you can do better than that. Come on. He's one of ours, amen? And he's a great leader. Come on, put your hands together for Mr. Shabazz. Amen. We just want to say thank you to you uh, for your leadership. Uh, we want to say thank you to this uh, local branch of the NAACP. We're always excited to see young people uh, who they are training. And our uh, young people, we want you to know that we're just so proud of you and we're proud of your work. And uh, we want to once again uh, say thank you to our speaker and um, to um, the prayer that we just had. Uh, the Bible says, faith without works is dead. And uh, as it was said earlier, all across this country, people are assembling in churches, uh, in higher education institutions, and uh, they're talking about the life and legacy of Dr. King. And if you leave this church and you don't put anything into action, then your works will be dead. But if you could leave here and love somebody, if you can leave here and lift somebody, if you can leave here and reach back and help somebody to get where you are, then you will be continuing the work of Dr. King. Now let's put our hands together for the work that we're going to do this upcoming year. We're going to ask everyone to stand at this time. How many of you know we shall overcome? How many of you really believe we shall overcome? Isn't it amazing how the words of this hymn that was sung during the civil rights struggle is still present and still very meaningful to us today? And listen what our ancestors said. They said, deep in my heart, I do believe 
that we shall overcome someday. And so we're going to sing one verse of this hymn. And as they did, we're going to ask you to reach across the aisles. And we're going to ask that you touch hands with the person next to you. And then we'll have the benediction. to say thank you for what we have experienced in this place. God, we thank you that we're not going through a routine right now, but God, we know that there's work to do. And so right now, God, we ask that you just continue to power, empower all of us in whatever role we play within this city to do a greater work for you. And God, we will not forget to give you the honor, the glory, and the praise. And now to him who's able to keep us from falling, may God's love rest rule and abide with each and every one of us until we meet again and the children we sang God is on our side 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 God is And you are to find three people that you don't know. And you are to introduce yourself to them and give them a holy hug and a kiss of peace. And that's the end of this service. Amen. After you've done that, you can leave. We shall go. Oh, come on. Find somebody. Find somebody. Give them a holy hug and a kiss of peace.